The only things of certainty in this world are death and taxes. Wise words from Benjamin Franklin. I've always thought burial practices in America were really weird. When our loved ones die, we drain their bodies of their blood. We remove their organs and stuff them full of fillers and chemicals. We dress them up, almost like dolls, and we paint their faces like clowns, with lots of fleshy colors and makeup to hide the fact they've been drained of all the colors that come with life. We go through so much effort to preserve them, to make them appear as though they're just sleeping, almost as if in denial of the fact they've died. And then we lock them in caskets, these big ornate boxes that we then lower into concrete vaults six feet underground. To prevent what? Or to protect them from what? Decay? As if they aren't supposed to do that. And then we place a stone to mark the place they've been buried. And because humans are always dying, we end up with miles upon miles upon miles of these vaults and stones, almost to deny these fleshy corpses their only remaining imperative, to decay and rejoin the earth. And let me be clear, I'm not bashing the custom by any means. I know some people need to have that place to go back to, to visit and memorialize their loved ones. And as much as I love the catharsis of a somber walk through a graveyard, on a very real note, I believe our society has lost its way in how it perceives the timeless reality of death. And so, each time I pass one of these fields of name-chiseled stones, I'm brought back to an ancient maxim we would do well to revitalize. Memento mori. Remember, you must die. Hi. Welcome to Cypher Grove, the channel where we dive deep into the profound esoteric mysteries of spirituality, religion, metaphysics, and the occult. Please remember to like, comment, and subscribe to help the channel grow. That said, please enjoy the video. I'd like to once again thank my Patreon supporters, including my first level 7 Grove Master member, Daniel Bradseth, who I'll be taking on as an apprentice. Thank you so much for believing in this channel, Daniel, and I look very much forward to working with you. Just as a reminder that if you enjoy this channel, please consider becoming a Patreon supporter, as you'll have access to a host of perks and benefits, including the Cypher Grove Discord channel, discounts on spiritual services, and starting at level 3, having your name included in my monthly blessing rituals. Also remember, you can now book appointments for a virtual consultation and chat with me using the link in the description. All right, let's get straight into the video. It's not a question of if we shall die. It's a command, a statement, a fact, with a period. It's an order. We must remember that the reality of death approaches somewhere on the horizon for each of us. Some people don't like to contemplate this. Lingering on the idea of dying seems depressing, gloomy, dark. So death is either outright ignored, or focus is shifted from it to something else, often a second life. A life often perfected of blemishes, or wrapped in the idea of some kind of reward or reconciliation, most often reuniting with loved ones who have gone before us, and while there is certainly nothing wrong with that, from a purely emotionless perspective. It does seem to be a tool used to help us forget about death in its most primal reality. Death is a part of the human story. I don't think it's the end of the story. I do believe in an afterlife, and in fact I believe in many afterlives. A cyclical continuation of a soul evolving through manifest existence, like a wheel rolling from place to place to place. Much like the seasons, as one thing wilts and dies, it sleeps a while, until it blossoms anew in the spring, teeming with life. This is exactly why deities presiding over death 
were often also associated with agriculture. The scythe being the most common tool of the harbinger of death, it reaps the old crop that was planted, so that the new may spring forth. Death is a doorway, the end of one space and the beginning of another. But until the time comes that you should cross it, what lies behind that door is entirely concealed. And yet for all of human existence, we seem to have on some deeply buried primal and subconscious level, some strange intuition of what is behind that door, almost as if we've been there before, but just forgotten the details. Much like hearing the muffled hum of someone speaking, but not being able to hear what they're actually saying. I think one of the biggest problems we have while we wrestle with the reality of death is all of our expectations of what it is and how it works. It's hard to come to peace with something you have subconsciously built into this idea of pain and loss, and even harder when you have some warped idea of what happens after. For as far back as I remember, back to some of my earliest childhood memories, I was always drawn to the macabre. To the point, most people saw me as kind of a weird kid. Now, we can say whatever we want about that evolving into my areas of interest as an adult, but looking back, I think it was something more than just a kid's quirks. Children are closer to the afterlife than adults. This is because they just came from there. As we age, we lose our memories of what existence was before. And from a reincarnation standpoint, we forget the details of our past lives as we grow. And some children are more sensitive to those memories than others. I think I was one of those kids. I had a mild obsession with gothic or macabre movies and theater, and still do, and always noticed as a kid how dramatic and expressive the macabre was portrayed. One of my favorite films growing up was Tim Burton's Corpse Bride, which depicted both the land of the living and the land of the dead. And it always fascinated me how colorful the land of the dead was depicted in this film. This place where the dead resided, which was basically portrayed almost the same way as the underworld of sorts, and was filled with so much music and color and particularly expressive character types in contrast to the land of the living, which was portrayed in heavy tones of gray and gloom with this sort of tired, agitatable, mundane theme. And it paints a picture of an underworld that is drenched in the shadow archetypes we associate with death, but expressing the colors manifest in the most repressed parts of the human spirit. And if an underworld does exist, which I believe does, and nearly every ancient society would agree with that, I think this might be some very small and caricatured glimpse into this reality. It's almost to create this very quiet message that those above are less free than those below, and that we who are so distracted in our waking lives have become slaves and lost the big picture of existence as a very free and boundless thing. We've lost the vigor of what it means to be human and exchanged it for mundane things. Almost as if to say, don't weep for those who have died. They are freer than you'll ever be in this earthly vessel. Do not pity the dead, Harry. Pity the living. And above all, all those who live without love. Reality on Earth has become akin to living in the Matrix. The human reality is constructed through ideas produced and assembled by language, and everyone lives in accordance with the rules we implicitly know are a part of living amongst other humans. These rules and patterns we adjust ourselves to in order to live in this preconceived matrix that is our reality often have the effect of repressing certain emotions, psychological phenomena, and otherwise expressions of the self. And I think death is a solvent. It's able to dissolve that matrix so that the human spirit is transmitted into its fullest actuation. Death is surrender. 
surrendering up the illusion that we have continued with all our lives. It's the removing of the ego's mask and handing it off to eternity. And in that surrender comes the reminder that the life you had was fragile and frail to begin with, as easily popped as a balloon by a needle while all this time you thought it was a fortified wall of stone. In the late Middle Ages, an artistic allegory became commonplace called the dance macabre, the dance of death. This genre of art often depicted the dead portrayed as skeletons or corpses, dancing frivolously and menacingly about the grave. It brings us back to that idea of the colorful and carefree nature the dead were portrayed as having in films like Corpse Bride and other gothic theatrical productions. It eventually grew into a festivity, wherein people would dress as skeletons and ghosts and dance in court ballrooms during events called masks. It became exceedingly popular during the time of the Black Death, the plague which devastated the world during the 14th and 15th centuries. It seemed the awareness of death was heavily augmented by the mortality of the plague, as people coped with the fact they could not deny how fleeting and fickle their lives were in the face of such a horrifying disease. But to look on this in a fearful light is to miss the whole point. The point is that we, as humans, must cope with the fragility of our lives. We cannot spend our lives fearing what is to come with death, and what comes after it, what kind of afterlife awaits us in the beyond. And I'm not saying you shouldn't make due preparations for the afterlife in whatever ways you see fit, but you must release the need for your human persona to cling to life in denial of your own fragility. To refuse to surrender is to rob yourself of the peace and oneness that comes with this ever-present function of the universe. In the tarot, death is represented as a skeleton in black armor, riding a pale white horse and campaigning through what looks to be the countryside of a medieval kingdom. If you carefully observe the bottom of the picture, it appears death has already claimed for himself the king of this land. The fallen king represents the ego, which is powerless in the face of death, and is the very first thing to be dissolved. I want to share with you a couple passages from a book regarding the death card, which has changed my life. It changed the way I look at death, and made me feel like a weight had been lifted off my shoulders. I was going to summarize it, but there's truly no way I could more perfectly describe this to you than to just give you the text. In her book, 78 Degrees of Wisdom, Rachel Pollock writes, The fact is, since we will not know what happens to our bodies once the spirit has left them, what we really fear is the destruction of the personality. It is the ego that sees itself as separate from life. Because it is only a mask, the ego does not wish to die. It wishes to make itself superior to the universe. If we can accept death, we will be able to live more fully. The ego never wants to release energy. It tries to hoard it against the fear of death. As a result, new energy cannot get in. We see this very graphically in people's breathing when they panic. They try to gulp air in without letting any out, and as a result become short of breath. In sex, too, the ego hoards energy. It fights climax and surrender, because at that moment the ego partly dissolves. In Elizabethan England, sexual intercourse was often called dying, and death in the tarot comes below the lovers. Much the goal of many who meditate is to put to sleep the jabbering maw of the ego to experience pure mind. You could even say meditation is a type of death. By stripping away the inner noise, bit by bit, slowly until you experience that strange stillness which comes with pure mind, pure nothing, but simultaneously pure everything. You have dissolved the ego. You have died. Because the ego resists the very idea of death and therefore keeps us from enjoying life, we must sometimes take extreme steps to get past it. 
The initiation rites always led up to a simulated death and rebirth. The initiate is led to believe that he or she is actually about to die. Everything is done to make this death as real as possible, so that the ego will be tricked and in fact experience that dreaded dissolution. Then, when the initiate is reborn, he or she experiences a new maturity and a new freedom of energy. In recent years, many people have experienced something very like these rites through using psychedelic drugs. They believe they are dying, and they feel themselves reborn. However, without the preparation symbolized in The Hanged Man, the experience can often be deeply disturbing. The four people demonstrate different approaches to change. The king, struck down, shows the rigid ego. If life comes at us with enough power, the ego may collapse. Insanity can result from an inability to adjust to extreme change. The priest stands and faces death directly. He can do so because his stiff robes and hat protect him and support him. We see here the value of a code of belief to help us past our fears of death. The maiden symbolizes partial innocence. The ego is not rigid, yet still aware of itself, unwilling to surrender. Therefore she kneels, but turns away. Only the child, representing complete innocence, faces death with a simple offering of flowers. Death wears black armor. We've already seen how blackness and darkness symbolize the source of life as well as its end. Black absorbs all color. Death absorbs all individual lives. The skeleton rides a white horse. White repels all colors and therefore symbolizes purity, but also nothingness. The white rose stands for the desires purified. For when the ego dies, selfish and repressive needs die with it. Death is not your enemy. Death is already a part of you. From the moment you're born, new cells are being produced within you, while old ones are replaced. Make no mistake, romanticizing death is not the goal. To glorify death or to try to speed up its process isn't healthy either. Nihilism is ultimately one of the greatest and most powerful enemies of human nature, in my opinion. But there's something to be said for those cultures who crystallize death into a deity, a god, an image to follow and honor. Santa Morte, Kalima, Hell, Thanatos, Cain. To fondly recall death, to know it as a person is something considered deeply taboo because it is the self-preserving ego which rules our society. People fear those who worship death because they fear death. They have not coped with their mortality, and to see someone who has is disturbing to them. I struggled with the idea of my mortality at an incredibly young age. It's quite strange. This is usually a crisis of identity and psychology you have when you've grown in age and you're on the downward slope of the human lifespan, but for me I was wrestling with the idea of death as early as the age of 19. And only when I was introduced to the tarot and the many practices of the left hand path did I finally understand a very important facet of this whole thing. To resist death is to cheapen life. And now, I do not fear death, but await him in innocent wonder, just as a soul awaiting the ferryman upon the edges of the river Styx would. The act of remembering that we must die, as this maxim suggests, is not to invoke fear or anxiety or depression into the mind, but quite the contrary. It's to make peace with it. I'll leave you with this famed quote from Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows. And then he greeted death as an old friend, and went with him gladly, and, equals, they departed this life. Thank you for watching.